as I look for my agenda. Welcome to today's City Council meeting. We are now in City Council work session. It is August 15th. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching from the Council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. This is a work session during which there's no public comment, but please join us tonight. And this is a little bit different during our 6 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. And of course, you can always reach out to us by mail at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84114. Email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Um, written comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website slccouncil.com. And the reason for our 6 p.m. start today is because we have a 7 p.m. Uh, truth and taxation hearing that needs to be noticed as a different meeting. So we're starting our general formal meeting items an hour early. Hopefully we'll wrap those up before, but we, if we need to, we'll reconvene after the truth and taxation hearing. But at any rate, the truth and taxation hearing will happen exactly at seven. So we're on item number one of our work session, which is updates from the administration. Um, that is, I see Joshua Boyo and Andrew Johnston here. Welcome. Thanks for being here and thanks for flexibility with time. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I'm Joshua Boyle. I'm the community liaison in the mayor's office for District 1 and District 5. Um, you can go to the sorry. next slide, please. Josh, could you just confirm you that the button to... is pressed on your microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Now the light's on. It was on before so okay okay get real uh, close so uh, as a reminder this is our web page for residents to go and engage with the city slc.gov slash feedback uh, next slide so we have a few updates from our transportation division uh, the Capitol Hill traffic calming project the expected construction start date is August 21st uh, transportation has sent postcards alerted the Community Council and are flyering homes in the immediate vicinity of the planned speed humps. The first batch of them will be on Wall Street and some of the minor side streets coming off of off 300 West, which are Fern, Reed, uh, and 700 North. And the target end date is mid-October. The 1000 West in, uh, intersection improvement and traffic calming. There's an active public survey on this project asking for input on proposed intersection concepts at 300, 400, and 500 North. The transportation is a division is planning to finalize the design of the 500 North intersection this year and aim for construction next year. And on uh, 600, 700 North, the reconstruction project, uh, two stakeholder meetings have happened and the, a public survey is live and the website for the project is 600northslc.org. The schedule is to have a concept established by the end of this year with the final design in 2024 and construction in 2025. From the Redevelopment Agency update, uh, community feedback is being sought on the natural active and plaza elements of the design plan for bringing portions of City Creek up to the surface along the Folsom Trail between 700 and 1000 West. Uh, and this is also together with the uh, Seven Canyons Trust and the website for that, uh, well, it's on the website at slc.gov slash feedback, um, a link to that survey. Next slide, please. This week, our community outreach team will be is holding office hours at local events uh, tonight at the Partners in the Park event at Northwest Rec Center, um, at Sugar House Rocks uh, concert series events on the 18th this Friday, and then this Saturday at the Kensington Street Festival. Next slide. And here's more of our events for the rest of the month. Um, tomorrow uh, is a Jordan River Bio Blitz with the Love Your Block team public lands and Hogel Zoo at Papa Grove Park. Mayor's Bike to Work Day is this Thursday, starting from Jordan Park. And um, Kensington Street Festival this Saturday uh, from 2 to 8 p.m. 
And that concludes my portion of, for the community outreach updates. So I'll turn it over to Andrew, unless there are any questions. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Josh. You can see the uh, utilization report still running very high uh, throughout the summer, of course. Rapid intervention, there's no encampment impact mitigation work this week, uh, but a number of camps, as you can see there, and uh, VOE continues to work with increasing number of camps, up to seven this week consistently, and then multiple uh, rehabilitation sites. You can see the resource fair that was happened last Friday at Library Square and some of the partners there. Uh, to give you a sense of what happens there, Odyssey House is a uh, substance use treatment program that's residential and outpatient and also a mental health component um, but they were there and they engaged with two people who went to detox um, and then planned to go back to Odyssey House which is pretty typical for a lot of times so um, this is one of those times where you need multiple providers to work together um, and it worked here at the at the library uh, we also know that the health department was there 28 vaccinations were given uh, free lunches from the justice Co food justice coalition and then uh, special thanks to Councilmember Valdo Moros, who's not here. Hopefully, she's listening somewhere, uh, for her uh, and your staff's work at that fair. So I appreciate it very, very much. Kayak Court will be the 18th in the Jordan River on the north, kind of central north end, North Temple to Cornell Street. Uh, and then we'll go to north, the next slide to give an update on the winter services planning. So we've been trying to update you all this uh, summer as the meetings have progressed from all the mayors across the county, and Councilmember dugan has been part of that as well. Uh, this past Thursday, the 10th, the, the Utah Homelessness Council approved, uh, accepted and approved the winter services plan that was submitted by the, by the mayors. That included over 600 beds of 24-7 operations. Uh, only 65 of those will be only overnight, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. at uh, St. Vincent de Paul. And then 175 of those are planned to be flex beds at the current resource centers. So that would mean at the Geraldine E. King, 50 beds, at the Gail Miller Resource, 50 beds, and then at the Pamela Atkinson in South Salt Lake, 75 beds. Those are planned to be open sometime in October and uh, run through the end of April, and then uh, across three different cities. And then the MVP program we've talked about previously in Sandy, uh, that is coming online probably in November, we're thinking at this point, and that will also have 165 beds for folks who have medical conditions or are seniors. And then you can see the VOA detox expansion. I believe they're going to have an opening, official opening coming up pretty soon, and they're adding, I believe, 50 more detox beds. Um, I think there'll be about 130 beds at that point, which is more than the 80 they had previously. And then there's also a Code Blue emergency option portion of this plan, which deals with situations below 15 degrees Fahrenheit across the county and uh, there's still some work to be done on those options with some other advocate groups and then the next step is working on some details about providers and the funding so Wayne Ederhauser of the state has really taken the lead on the funding piece and also working with potential providers for these programs are there questions on that that we could answer today uh, yeah we do have questions Councilmember Pui and then Petro yes uh, Andrew thank you for the update and I, I saw the the flex, uh, I, I read about that. And it, do you know if there's an additional funding for mitigation uh, because of the flex for the area? You know, just for remediation. Just uh, mi mitigation. Uh, mitigation. So, yeah, yeah, like some police uh, funding or whatnot. So generally, yeah, what happens is the they've got different tiers in the mitigation fund. We get the tier one for our base funding, uh, that over three million a year, and then the tier three is for winter overflow, and that's done proportional to the number of beds you have. So if there are six hundred beds and Salt Lake City has a uh, hundred of them, just for say, probably one hundred sixty-five at least here, get um, you get that percentage of that money uh, statewide. So yeah, there will be additional funds for us to use. Okay, that's good to, to hear. Petro? Okay, so I have questions in two veins, both coming from constituents. Um, HB 499, the flex was supposed to be a last, a worst case scenario if a plan wasn't accepted. This year it's included as part of the plan itself. Is that a function of us acknowledging that we need such a significant number of beds more than we've historically looked at? Or is there a different reason for why we're flexing as part of the initial plan? Yeah, so in our discussions last year, as you brought up, um, the, perp the, the focus of that group, the Conference of Mayors last year, was to find other alternatives, and then they broached the subject of a flex as sort of a backup to that. Um, 
Now that set a precedent, obviously. And so this year, when the number of beds went from 400 to 600, there was a big gap, obviously, in needing more beds. So the mayors and the work that was done identified flex as one option to do that. It's not the only one, but it was part of that base plan that the mayors accepted and put forward as a group to the state. And the state accepted that. So yeah, the 175 are part of that base plan now. Oh, good. I'm glad I didn't lie to the constituent then. That's <laughs> that was the explanation. And again, this is. Uh, we do still have our conditional use requirements uh, on that, and I believe um, the the city is going to have to take action to allow that increase. Uh, now, if we don't, the state could override it regardless, but um, that doesn't go away. So this is a temporary plan for six months, but the conditional use still stands. Okay. And then the second part is, I know we at one point had been looking at a city-based code blue. We know that between 32 degrees and 15 degrees, and given the right conditions, even above 32, cold weather can certainly be dangerous. Are we still investigating those opportunities? Is that something as a council we can continue to do alongside you to help? Is there that 15 degrees code blue, by the time it's 15 degrees, significant damage could have been done to a lot of people. Sure. Yeah, I mean, anything cold is cold, right? Right. Um, in Salt Lake County, we have our base number of beds year-round, and then the winter overflow is meant to address the below 32, the cold. So these 600 beds are meant for that overall. What's happened in previous years is you had, say, 400 or 300 beds, and then you still had some gap there. And so for folks who may be reticent to come in for slightly colder conditions, who would be more likely to come in really cold conditions, that's where that cold blue thing came in. That's why the 15 degrees is pretty low. Otherwise, if it's a 32, it's essentially the base for basically two to three months of the full thing. So um, that's where that sort of thought process came in for this group. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody couldn't identify their own code blue. Um, that's up to a municipality or a county to do that. Um, however, if we did that city by city, it would also cause a confusion within the county, for instance, about who's declaring it and are you in the city at that time or not kind of thing, and do you come to that city for that reason. That's why the state decided to do it on a state level and then identify per county how to do that to make it a little more uniform and not have that city to city um, differences. So then in that vein, will these beds, the 600 plus, whether Flex and other elsewhere, I mean, it feels like this homelessness crisis is at odds with our need for water. Like, I'm really praying for another super snowy winter, terrified for the people who don't have a roof over their heads. So let's pray and, and hope that we do have another snowy winter. Will these 600 beds in all those locations be 24-7 so people aren't out in the middle of the day? I know last year we saw some days that didn't even get to 32, thankfully, yeah. because of the snow. Yeah, the the number this year is much higher. Part of that is a realization there are more folks. But if you look at the average the last few years, it hasn't been 600. It's probably been closer to between three and four maybe, right? Um, but on the worst nights, based on what we saw last winter, it got that high. And so that's why the planning was let's go maximum so that you have that built-in flexibility when it's um, maybe a lot of nights you'll see some beds not, not used. Um, we hope most of them will be. But when you have to have them, they're there. So ideally, this takes care of a lot of what we might think of as cold blue. Um, that's my hope. Um, and then have cold blue on top of that for the really worst conditions so that we don't have that gap again. And so they are 24-7 so that people yeah, can stay. Everything except for St. Vincent de Paul, um, which is always sort of daytime used for meals and then nighttime for that overflow. And oftentimes, there's actually a pretty defined group of men generally who go to St. Vinny's uh, for that purpose. Um, most everybody else is going to be moved into the other beds 24-7, so they don't have to be bust in and out and that sort of thing. Thank you. Andrew, 175 plus 65 is 240, so that leaves 360 plus. Is that a, a new facility yet to be announced publicly that will function for winter overflow for this year? Yeah, there, there will be another one. There'll be another location, another facility, as you alluded to. And it's uh, not public yet where that is, or we don't no. know yet where that is. Yeah, okay. it's not yet. Um, and then you also think of the MVP has got 165 beds. So that, that would counts. actually draw people towards, yeah, that'll count towards the this. 600, okay. Um, I think the VOA detox beds could be kind of part of that 50. Uh, and then there's also contingencies. Uh, I think that's the, the bulk of right there. That'd be the 600. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Council members, any additional questions for Andrew or Josh? Thank you for being here. Oh, just, just real quick, ahead, you know, the uh, uh, road or the uh, VOA 
uh, young adults, 18 to 24, is not included in this count. But that went from 30 to 50 beds, and that's not included in this count. So, yeah, so uh, to Councilmember Dugan's point, last year the council allowed them to increase from 30 to 50. That was temporary, though, so that's not permanent. Um, so that is not included in this planning piece. Um, so I think if the city wanted to work with VOA on that, again, I'm, I'm sure they would be amenable to it. It also, this does not count families. And so there are currently 100 uh, family options right now. And last year we thought we needed more than that. So there are still plans being made to add more capacity for families separate than this plan. And, and that's, that would be also outside of Salt Lake City uh, location yet to uh, be announced. Yeah, that's correct. For families. Okay. Great. Um, I, I, for one, would like to know if the VOA needs us to increase that cap again for the youth center. I, I didn't hear anyone say that that had a negative impact on the community. And if we helped 20 more youth be sheltered for the winter, I, I would like to do that again if we okay. need to. I can reach out to them and contact you all too. Thanks. All right. Seeing no more questions, we'll move on to item number two on our work session agenda, which is a zoning map amendment at approximately 2350 North and an annexation at approximately 2441 North Rose Park Lane. I'll give a quick introduction and then turn the time over to Daniel. This is the briefing about the annexation for the properties located at approximately 2350 North Rose Park Lane. We, there's going to be a map up here just a second detailing the three, so I won't uh, give those addresses. This change would facilitate the future development of a mixed-use, multifamily residential development with the potential for up to 1,800 units. The zoning of properties being annexed into the city receive their zoning designation during that process. They do not go through a separate rezoning process. However, there is a significant public process as a part of that. So um, that is what the council is discussing today. So with that, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? So again, this is a request by J. Wright Properties. There are two petitions involved. Uh, one is a rezone request for property at 2350 North Rose Park Lane, which is shown in yellow on the map, from the AG2 Agricultural Zone to the RMU Residential U Mixed Use Zone. The other request is an annexation request, which is highlighted in blue on the map, uh, where the applicant is requesting the RMU Zone for the property they own at 2441 North. And then the city is proposing the OS Zones for the city and state properties at 2462 and 2440 North. Uh, the applicant's petitions are intended to accommodate an 1800 dwelling unit development on their private property. And just to clarify, the state and city properties are not involved in that. Uh, and just up front, this proposal received a negative recommendation from the Planning Commission. Next slide. Daniel, was that Planning Commission recommendation, did that match the staff's recommendation to Planning Commission? Uh, it did not. The staff recommendation was uh, positive. Positive, okay. But thanks. with a number of conditions. Okay, thanks. Are you going to walk us through why, why the Planning Commission disagreed with the staff recommendation? Yes. Okay, great. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Uh, can I get the next slide? So just for some context, the properties are located just off of the 2100 North Freeway exit on I-215 end of the city. Uh, the properties are along a canal as well as Rose Park Lane, which is the road right off of that interchange exit. Uh, that part of Rose Park Lane is pretty rough, so any development would require uh, new road improvements. Uh, the property to the southeast is the Salt Lake Regional Athletic Complex, which has a large num um, number of playing fields. And just to the north of that is the state's off-highway vehicle state park that's used for OHV and ATV riding. Uh, to the east of those is the Jordan River and the Jordan River Trail. And uh, one thing not shown on this map, but southerly on this map, uh, was that there is a residential neighborhood just to the south of the rack, and that also includes uh, two schools, an elementary and a middle school. So just for some future context, the rack is planned to be expanded to fill the entire uh, area that's shown as city property, uh, but there is no current, no current date for that expansion. Uh, along with that, there is plans for a new future north access road shown as the Sports Park Boulevard on this map in orange. Uh, that road would ultimately connect Rose Park 
uh, lane with Redwood Road. Uh, the city did receive a million dollars from the state recently to build that. Uh, the city has just uh, selected a consultant to start some initial preliminary design work uh, and some cost work on that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as standards of consideration, the 2350 North property in yellow is already in the city and is part of the rezone request. A rezone is reviewed against the city's standard considerations, which generally have to do with consistency with master plans, compatibility, and impact to city services. Uh, the annexation component of this is a little different. Uh, except for some dimensional considerations, there are no formal consideration requirements. The city just has to apply a zone when it's annexed. So because of that, uh, the council forwarded the annexation to the Planning Commission for a recommendation last year. And because there's no city standards on that, staff used the city's rezone standards in reviewing the request. Next slide. So the applicant is requesting the RMU zone for the property. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the major requirements of that zone. Uh, for height, the zone allows for up to 75 foot tall development, which is about seven stories. Uh, has limited setbacks intended to pull development close to the street. Uh, there is a 20% open space requirement. And on top of that, there is a 20 foot uh, landscape tree buffer required along the freeway. Uh, beyond that, the zone allows for a mix of mostly residential uses, including multifamily and low intensity commercials uses like retail, restaurants and office uses. Daniel, the 20, you said 20 foot landscape buffer along the freeway is in the base zoning? It is. Of RMU? Interesting. Yep. So it applies to any zone, actually. Any zone. Any zone. Okay. Yep. It's not because it, it seems like RMU probably wasn't initially intended for all the properties along a freeway. Right. So right. This is yep. any zone. Yep. It's okay. universal. So, quick, quick question, Mr. Chair. Uh, remind ahead, me, this portion of the freeway doesn't have any sound walls, correct? No. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Go. So one key consideration for a rezone is master plan policies. Again, the city is proposing to zone the city and state properties to the open space zone. And in this case, the properties are in the Rose Park plan, which was adopted in 2001. Uh, that plan calls for open space or agricultural zoning for the properties. And the proposal matches exactly that uh, and would support the use of the properties for the rack and the state park in the future. Uh, the privately owned properties are different though. The requested RMU zone doesn't match the master plan's future land use policy, which again calls for that agricultural or open space zoning. Uh, the plan's policy discussion on that just notes the reason for that zoning is so that the properties will be compatible with the recreational and open space land uses on the rack and the state park. Uh, there are a number of citywide policies that could support the rezone and some that do not. Uh, some policies that could support the proposal include access to recreation for residents, uh, redeveloping underutilized properties, uh, and using existing infrastructure. But there are policies that might not support it, like prioritizing development with access to transit for residents, which this property doesn't currently have. Next slide. So two key issues with this zoning request are traffic and freeway impacts. Uh, the applicant provided a traffic study that recommended a phased approach for improvements to support the applicant's development. Uh, those are first striping and intersection improvements to Rose Park Lane and the freeway interchange that would support up to 500 units. And ultimately though, uh, it would require completion of the North, North Access Road before the development could be fully completed with 1,800 units. Freeway noise and air quality impacts were also identified, and those could be mitigated with noise attenuating materials in construction that's similar to what is required around the airport, as well as higher quality HVAC filters and trees to help reduce pollution impacts. Uh, next slide. So as far as public input, we received two letters opposed to the rezone, and we received one letter suggesting conditions related to health and air quality uh, nine people spoke generally against the proposal at the Planning Commission public hearing. Uh, their concerns were generally about traffic, infrastructure, uh, general public access being limited to the rack, and air quality and noise concerns. Next slide. So the commission provided a negative recommendation on the rezone and annexation. For the rezone, the commission noted the zoning did not match what is called for in the Rose Park plan, which again calls for the agricultural or open space zoning. For the annexation, the commission referenced Plan Salt Lake and the council's 2016 housing policy statements. 
uh, specifically that Plan Salt Lake supported residential with recreational access, but that the RAC won't actually allow residents to use the fields. And they also referenced the 2016 housing policy statement that supports residential near transit, uh, which the site currently doesn't have access to. And I should note that on the city and state properties, uh, the commission didn't provide any concerns on that annexation request. Next slide. So having said that, the staff recommendation was positive, uh, but with a lot of conditions mostly related to mitigating freeway noise and air quality concerns and ensuring that adequate road improvements were constructed by the developer. So that is all I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Where did the 1800 unit number come from? That is from the developer. That's their maximum development plan. That they told us. Yes. Right, because RMU has no, develop no density restriction. Correct. So it could be unlimited. Number it could, yep. Okay. Um, it could be unlimited as far as they can fit it uh, because there is still some setbacks and some issues with it. Property some setbacks. Is, and it's a very correct. odd shape. Yeah. Parcel right, yeah. I mean, parking it's a 75 well. foot maximum. So it, at that point, it's the building height yeah. that is restricting the amount of density. Yeah. Uh, also, RMU is in the urban center context. Correct. Parking, which requires zero parking spaces per yes. unit. Um, which makes sense where there's transit. Right. How, how did staff um, consider that? So on that, that one, we thought it was more appropriate to include a condition that would require it to comply with the two parking stall per unit requirement, which is more of it for areas that don't have and that is transit that in access. in the 13 conditions just not listed on this yes. slide? Okay. Yes. So two parking stall, which context is that in? That's the uh, general the CG, context? To the, yeah, the general context. So... RMU, but with the general context for parking, was staff's recommendation in approval. Can we get the full list of, uh, I don't know if, are there, I'll, I can look in the packet too. Thanks. Yes, I'll send those to you. Okay. Sorry, did That's you have something. more slides? Oh, no, that was it. And members, any other questions for staff? I mean, I had some of the policy questions. I was interested in some of the policy questions noted on the uh, staff report uh, regarding the uh, affordability of the units. Um, and uh, there was one that was thought it was very uh, right. Oh, where was it? This is what happens when I do too many things at the same time. Um, oh, yeah, the Westside Community Initiative, if some of the project will be... Uh, eligible for some of that, those funding, uh, for that funding, which I think is a, it, it will be a great place if that's possible. We just have to remember there's no transit out there, and so it might be a better place for us to address the other missing stock, like the 80 to 125. Yeah, and I, I you know, I think that to the broader conversation on this, you know, UTA, because it's, you, it, you know, the transit is, uh, is not considered a utility for the state, uh, uh, and, and it should. Uh, density will allow, hopefully, to to actually make a justification for the transit line that we also need for many of the companies in the Inland Port. I just attended the graduation f from Stadler, uh, the apprenticeship graduation, and many of these kids have a hard time to get to these very good paying jobs in the West, in, in, in the Inland Port, you know, talking about Stadler, but um, it's, it's very important that we have a transit uh, system that connects people from the west side, especially, but not only the west side, to these jobs, and density might allow us to justify some of this I get transit it. lines. Councilor Dugan? I have a, 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 a number of concerns, but I just want to touch on the, the one concern that Councilor Mapui we just mentioned about transit out there. You're right, this may be affordable uh, living, but it's not, excuse me, affordable housing possibly affordable housing, but it's not going to be affordable living without some transit because, but we also have a lot of transit concerns across the city in general right now. So we're, we're going to add a, a, an additional transit uh, issue and concern in, in one area that's not been built where we have a city right now that doesn't have a very good transit plan. When you have transit that's every 30 minutes, no one will use that but if, uh, because it's not frequent enough. So we have an issue with transit across the city, and now we're adding another issue of transit to an area that is far from a lot of places and far from jobs 
onto that mix and onto that expense. So I, that's where my concern is on the on the transit side. And I, I, will, I think I will argue against that I, I, in the opposite direction of that. You know, we already have we have the prison down, you know, not too far from there. We have the airport, we have the Indian port, and many of those jobs the are already there. Uh, the, uh, the, I, and I, we have an issue connecting these right. pieces together. So I think that for the, to make this the, the argument to the state, which is. You know, we don't control much of the transit in the state. We just try to fit in some of those pieces, but we don't have the limited resources to do this. Um, mm -hmm. Is hopefully the density allows us to get to a yeah. place where we actually have better transportation I, I, I for these that, other parts. I understand too. that, but I, the airport, the uh, prison, and this location are not near near each other. They're on opposite sides. This one's on I-15 North. The prison is far away out 18. But I, I understand, and I think that discussion needs to be had with UTA and the state because transit is a big deal across the city. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're not adding to that transit uh, deficit by building a place that's so far out there with, with other concerns. Uh, I'm just thinking the health impact of that location, the mosquito impact, uh, and other, uh, the noise pollution that, yes, we attenuate noise in the, in the building, but we don't attenuate the noise outside when the kids are playing. Well, and in that vein, since you brought it up, um, my neighbors out there have been suffering in silence for a long time. Their CIP request wasn't even considered for funding. It was overlooked completely. You'll recall that I just secured the two traffic calming signs as a sign to them that we hear them. Development like this not only brings density that allows us to justify increased attention out there, which is sorely needed. They have no sidewalks. They have no curbs and gutters. They have no sound walls. They don't even have a fully paved road it keeps crumbling, they don't have adequate drainage, a development like this, if we leverage it appropriately, can actually improve quality of life. We put people on our team who, with the state, can justify why we need the sound wall, who have a high level of success in getting those sorts of things. I actually am optimistic that if we as a city are smart with how we engage these developers and this project, we actually end up with a net positive for the people who are already living there under terrible circumstances while creating something that is positive for future Salt Lakers. Let me, let me just, uh, Councilman Newkin has a question again, but let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. In terms of transit, but also things like sound attenuation around the freeway and other things, there's already a lack on the west side and there's a hope This space that in particular compared to the rest of the west side, like we have the on-demand service elsewhere on the west side. But these, this is a room, right. Okay, so there's a hope that a new development will help us fill some of those gaps that already exist in the, in the there's community. A gauged, there's a gauged willingness. The developer has already voluntarily okay. met with constituents, have created an exhaustive list of the constituents who actually live there next to the project and has asked the question already, can you live with this and what do we need to bring to the table to make your life more livable? Okay, so for staff, and then I'll get back to you, Councilman okay. Dugan, but for staff, if the developer is willing to help meet some of the needs that the community already has in return, for, uh, like if we support this rezone and the developer saying they're willing to do this, we don't really have a legal way to do that, right? Because that would be an exaction or that would be like a taking or something. But like, what is, I'm assuming the answer is development agreement, but what is the tool that allows us to actually get those public benefits that it sounds like there's a willingness to provide, make sure that those actually come, that's a little bit stronger than just, yeah, we can do that as long as interest rates don't rise and our, primary lender you know like all these yeah. seven different things that don't that we that neither us nor the city control as long as those don't happen then we will provide those but if those any of those happen then we can't right like what is the actual tool for us to to get some of those things uh, so they are asking for an increase in their development potential so you can you can justify those sort of things through I a see, development okay. agreement because they're asking for something more but the tool would be a development yeah. agreement Okay. Yeah. And oh, sorry, Nick. Go ahead. So the developer is here, and they can you can ask. Yeah, them and we'll give the developer questions. time as yeah. as soon as we're done drilling so, Daniel with questions. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the, the discussion here. The the one thing I concerns me on the sound and the noise pollution that we would see out here. This is next to a freeway, which is almost like being next to an airport. And those sound walls work really well for a single story home in the vicinity of that sound wall. 
But once it bounces off that sound wall, it goes back and it hits a, a place maybe about a mile away, and that sound is very is, is uh, accentuated. On a sound wall also, if you're in a seven-story building, the sound wall works well for the first couple floors. But after that, you open up your window and you don't have anything. And I just know that from experience. I have some, uh, some friends that live just off of uh, I-15 and, uh, and I-80. They open up the window. They're, they're probably a half mile up the hill. You can't have a conversation out there any time of the day because of the, the freeway noise. So Our I, constituents made very clear the realities that they're living with. I would say that it is still needed, and having this on our team is a hope that that area has not seen. When I was canvassing for my own election, I came home with sore throat because of the level at which you have to speak mm -hmm. to overcome. They have the decibel readers in their yards, 80 to 90 decibels on an average day. So while it won't solve all the problems, it surely is chance at something that we haven't had. I have been rejected three times now by the good people at UDOT for this improvement, despite the cases that I'm making, that there's a material change to the use since that highway was put in. Yes, it's not perfect. Yes, there are people, but let's look at those. When I got here, I took an apartment um, off of North Temple in 600 West, and it directly overlooked Highway 15, and I got $500 a month off my rent because it was so loud in there. So we can just look at it as naturally occurring affordable housing assistance. Okay, I think we've done a good job of bringing up a lot of considerations. I don't think we're going to answer no, where no, the no. council is going to land on these policy considerations. Is there new considerations? Just, 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 not just arguments yeah. about the same thing? Yeah, I was just back on the setbacks. We had the two canals in the, in the vicinity, so we we want to make sure that the uh, setbacks from the canal, building setbacks from the canal, and the environmental impact. Okay, make sure that the canal is. The canals and exactly the two canals that are right there uh, nearby. Okay. It's just so another canal concern I have. Can flow. Council member Wharton, I saw your hand, and then Pui. I'd like to get out new concerns rather than trying to decide whether or not yeah. the sound thing is going to be mitigated or not. I think that takes a little more time. Go ahead. So my question's about, this reminds me a little bit of the the one property that they wanted to do residential and um, now we're walking back from that. I think it was, that was called Misty Water when we annexed. Um, that, um, I mean, that one was in a flight path. This one's by a freeway. But the, the other thing in common with them is that this would have been a residential, like entirely surrounded by commercial and, and really like cut off from amenities and things. What a, is that a concern here too? Because it, it seems like it's, I mean, I'm looking at pictures around it and I'm like, where, where are people going to go to get groceries, things like that? Yeah. So originally the request was RMF 75, which wouldn't allow any sort of commercial uses to be built in this development. So staff proposed the RMU zone, which would allow them to integrate some sort of, could be a small grocery or something into the development to support so those quick trips there otherwise they would have to travel a little bit further than the adjacent neighborhood just south of the rack uh, to get are services any, are we aware of like any other plans in the area that would be that would support something like this sorry can you repeat that Thank you. are do we are we aware of any other like plans in the area with other land property owners that you know might support something like this or does it seem like things are kind of growing up that way that there would be more amenities and other than the fact that it's next to an OHV park and the rack. Besides Worry about them being isolated. Yeah. Um, from things yeah, that, that people continues, need. It continues to be a food desert, and the mixed use was actually a request for me, because even if we can't get a full-size grocery store or those other things that we're talking about, I'm hoping for bodegas and other things. We have a constituency that has experienced this isolation. Mm -hmm. um, who again expressed that same concern? So you're tracking right with the community's so, concerns. Ms. I think to answer some of this, you know, I think that's it's important to note that this is not a completely isolated place. You know, there is a two-minute away neighborhood right south of this. Mm -hmm. There is also, uh, I mean, unfortunately, we only have a couple of supermarkets on the west side, but it's you know, eight minutes away from Smith's. Uh, you know, and I'm. You know, I'm almost eight minutes away also from Smith uh, and the, and the uh, Glendale neighborhood myself. So just FYI. So it may not be as isolated as, okay. I mean, it's just two minutes okay. from the next neighborhood south. Okay. I think it's, it's, no, it's no exception to the west side issue that is we don't have enough things like food stores. So this is, okay, 
any other new, I have food desert, transit, access, sound attenuation, canal. Chris? So since they won't be able to use the rack um, or the OHV, I mean, do you think that this is enough green space? You know, I see there's a playground and a trail and lots of trees and stuff in the in the plans. Do you think that this is enough green space for a development like that? I, I don't I don't know what the appropriate number should be for 1,800 dwelling units ultimately. I think 20% is quite a lot of space, though, on the site. It could support any amenities that that many number of residents may need. Okay. Okay, great. so green space. I'm trying to take a list of things that we want to consider. Um, on the city side, the roadway as it interact the new road as it interacts with the river trail, making sure that there's whatever passability for bicyclists, walkers, all those other things. Um, not just, of course, there's the environment. What? So as the roadway is constructed, going from that location back to Redwood Road, it'll have to cross over not only the canals, but also the river trail. And so we just need to be especially conscientious to make sure that I don't want the bikers or walkers to have to cross a roadway. That's a really nice open use kind but of council member warren brought up green space on site you're talking about green space and infrastructure off site right and this is strictly which, this which is strictly piece? a city consideration since we'll be constructing okay. the road off site yeah i don't amenities. want us to have to go cross the road and stop i'd like us to be able to continue that free flow if possible okay but that's an off site consideration in addition to the on-site green it's a, it's a consideration okay. for the city as part of the project because that road has to be constructed in okay. order for the project to go forward all right councilman please did you have additional things to add to this list no okay so i just want to ask a, i'm i want to i'm sorry i know we're way behind but um no but they just can't really just i'm the first to admit that our zoning ordinance doesn't have all the tools in it or need like we've been talking i've been talking about this every time i have an opportunity for the last i don't know how long so um, like stuff right with the understanding that we often have to fit square pegs into round holes with our zoning ordinance in order to get a good project to become legal. Um, this feels like a really square peg in a really round hole to do RMU or RMF 75 this far away from transit, this far away from the downtown core, where we, we routinely say no to that level of density, even like right downtown or right close to downtown so um what is the condition here that i need to understand as to why we would take what i would consider a fairly aggressive um like fitting we're being pretty liberal with our tools right and i think we have to be because our our zoning ordinance doesn't have all the tools in it but like what are the actual like zoning considerations that got staff to a, a recommendation of positive. So I think what really got us there was the compatibility and what other potential uses would make sense on this property. I think the RMU or residential zones with, or low, low intensity commercial zone is gonna be most appropriate next to a big open space facility like the rack versus like an industrial zone for the property. But why not like an RMU 35 instead of just R? Uh, with that, there isn't really a negative impact from the height because so, there's yeah, not an adjacent property to shade or to block views for yeah that 75 feet isn't going to really negatively impact the the rack for example okay. so actually ironically to the extent that it is far away from other developed properties it may be in staff's opinion appropriate to allow the additional height right that we typically wouldn't that far away from the downtown right. core is that what i'm Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything else that I should like, just from a pure zoning, like, am I wrong? It's 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 odd it, for it, this it, zone to be that far from the yeah. The center as, of the far city. as far as our normal zoning quest, this is further than this is a pretty far get. jump. And I'm not saying it's the wrong place, but <laughs> I want to understand what that means and what precedent we're setting and and all that. So, yeah. Um, Anything else in terms of before we invite the the, the applicant? The, the other thing was that 
it would support use of existing city resources once that road's yeah. actually built. If Meaning that road's already planned, yeah, they're north. Yeah, if that road's okay. planned, perhaps there should be it users of that road. It is directly across the street from one of the largest city amenities, I guess. Okay, yeah, I can see some it, of those. And it does support um, redevelopment of Rose Park Lane, which also is in pretty bad condition that yeah. the city may have to fund itself as part of that north access road if no development comes. Okay, this is all really helpful. I think we should give the applicant, um, I, it's our tradition that you get five minutes um, to answer any of the things we just discussed or do whatever you want with your five minutes. Chair, council members, thank you very much for giving us time. I'm Wade Budge. I'm here representing J. Wright Communities. I have with me Lincoln Schertz, who is a consultant advising on the project, as well as our urban planner who works with me, um, Jason Bull. And I'll try to be brief, and I really want to thank staff for their um, presentation. They did a very good job. I want to highlight a few items at the outset. We have a PowerPoint that we've been reviewing with neighbors, and we're going to make this available to them after today's meeting. And we won't really, in five minutes, have time to go through every one of the slides, but I want to get to some of the issues that have been raised in the discussion. Um, first of all, we want to think about this area as an area where there's a need to bring additional services and vitality. And what we're trying to do with this zone is bring that vitality to this area. So while it is true, as staff indicated, that under the zone, the zoning potential could be as high as eight, over 1,800 units, our project, and we'd be willing to put this in a development agreement, that would be a condition of the zone. So in other words, if the zoning doesn't happen unless a development agreement is prepared, that meets the council's um, approval would be for a project with 1,320 units, so 1,320 units, so fewer than what the property might otherwise allow. And let's go to slide eight. So we, let's see here. I'm gonna just get us to the elevation so we can talk a little bit about the principles. This is what the view would look like from someone on I I-215. This is a sample, if you will. The intent here is to make sure that we're bringing a project that will help bring the resources we need for the Sports Park Boulevard. So when we talk about why this project makes sense here, we would ask that we put into this de development agreement a condition that we cannot go behind, beyond 500 units until that road is in. That way the city knows that that road occurs and is developed. We've already shown good faith in trying to work with the city to help get that initial dollar, dollars to start the project. But furthermore, we think there's an opportunity to bring needed other improvements in that area, including sound walls, which have been discussed, and also to make sure that we're including um, the making of improvements to Rose Park Lane, which will benefit not only this project, but broader uh, group of residents. We also have heard as we've talked to neighbors about the need for more retail in that area. It is true as Council Member Petro said, we are going to include mixed use within this project. So a bodega, other kind of opportunities for um, shops and retail within the ground level. But we also know that by bringing this number of, of residents to this area, we're gonna attract the attention of retailers who will be more inclined to come and provide other uh, retail options in that Redwood Road area. We're really viewing this as a way where this project has two primary ways in and out. One will be over to Redwood Road through the Sports Park Boulevard because that's one way where you'd want to go and shop. The other would be, of course, off of Rose Park Lane down to I-215. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is this is a highly amenitized project. We wanna attract workers from the airport, inland port, the, um, all the vitality that's already occurring in that area, but make it so they're able to live closer to their work. We, this will be, admittedly, because of the transit items that have already been at transit difficulties, will be a car um, community initially, at least until transit priorities change for the UTA. But, and so if you go through our tables of what we're planning for the project, it will have oh, more parking than what's required by the zoning, but we also have over 41% of the site as landscape area. And we think that's important to make sure it's a nice project that people would want to come and live in and be part of. We've also adjusted the, mi the, the mix of units so that there will be three bedroom units included among the different types of classes because we want to have a variety of different family sizes represented in this community. And then lastly, I would just offer, we, we, getting back to the amenities, this is a, a community that would have pools, it would have bike, um, maintenance rooms and storage and locker areas. We want to make sure that those people who come here know that they can have an active lifestyle and go right 
down to the Jordan River through a trail that we would say is part of this project too, making sure that it works. So we're pleased with the support we've received from members of the community, the members we have received from uh, the support we've received from staff, and frankly, we felt support even from the Planning Commission because our 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 vote there was a close one, it was a four-six vote, and it was primarily just because of some open issues that we've since developed more since we were with the Planning Commission. We've adjusted the bedroom counts, we've better worked on our mixed use component, we've understood better what are the amenities that need to be included, and so as council weighs and considers this matter, I would envision that if we were to get to the point of getting an approval, it would be conditioned upon a binding development agreement that would make sure that these commitments that we're offering have to come forward and material be, be offered in advance. And then Lincoln? Yeah, I was just gonna mention <clears throat> to the infrastructure improvements as Wade mentioned, the million dollars that came to the city was really our initial effort to demonstrate that we're committed to the project and want to make sure that there's viable transportation systems within the community, recognizing that most of the shopping and retail experiences are going to happen on Redwood Road. But in terms of the development agreement, fully developing that infrastructure, developing sound walls. I think that's your five minutes. Thank you. And others would be helpful. So we're um, happy to be a part of that in the development agreement. Thanks. Thank you. The, a million dollars has already been given to the city. Right. In what form? So uh, on behalf of the developer, we sought a legislative appropriation that was awarded by the legislature to the Department of Transportation through interlocal agreement. They have committed those funds to Salt Lake City for the engineering work to be done on the connection between this proposed development and Redwood Road. Okay, I'll, I'll need to get some follow-up on that. Find out later. Um, In our view, that's the beginning, Chair. The... the uh, Rendering that we were just looking at. Yes. What was I looking at on the ground floor there with all those windows? So a lot of that would be the location of mixed use and also parking. So we have park. The building would be five stories above the parking as well as wrapped mixed use. I think that's what um, one thing I'm concerned with. Okay. With just looking at the rendering is that uh, we've made a lot of mistakes in in the, in history with large ho large scale housing projects that don't have the appropriate. Um, either just site design or mix of retail and commercial, mix of incomes, mix of all sorts of things. I want to make sure we're not recreating those same problems. And if this is 100% parking on the ground floor with all the units above, I would say that's recreating those same problems. And the people that live there are going to have a lower quality of life because of that. So I think there's some things that I would like to know whether they uh, occur in the base zoning of RMU that require ground floor activation, or if we need to b build them in where I really think, again, I, I think we're making a square peg fit around hole with RMU zoning this far out because RMU really is something that we think of as like one infill property in a, in a larger block, and this is not the case. So um, do those tools exist? I'm not asking you to answer this. I'm asking okay. staff to follow up with me later, but do those tools exist in the base RMU zoning to make sure that the ground floor of this large development is activated, is safe? It's not just a closed parking garage. Um, a, a piece of glass with a car parked behind it does nothing to make sure that the person walking their dog right outside that piece of glass is safe. So how do we make sure that this is a, is a that those issues are, are mitigated. Chair. Council Member Baldwin Morris and then Pui. I, I agree with you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm a little, um, this is kind of like out far away, so I'm, I'm okay with the density, but I'm slightly disappointed on the design and like how, you this, know, 11. This is a concept only. Okay, all, all right, Member. oh good. It's okay. only a concept. We, we weren't gonna even engage a full architecture okay. review until all we right. n understood what okay. the, feelings okay. are of the council. So I'm going with what Council Member Mano is okay. saying. I think I will really work on this project to make it like a livable place because okay. that's kind of far away and until we get all the transportation people, this this looks like a downtown thing more than an out there thing. So I would like um, this to be a place where you're comfortable going. I mean, you're so close to the river. I mean, it could offer so many things to the residents than what I see right now. So those are my hopes and wishes. Thanks. Mr. Council Chair, Pui. the I mean, this is the view from the freeway, right. Uh, allegedly, right? So you wouldn't put commercial 
on the side of the freeway. And I, I, I understand what you're saying. But if you raise the, this comment on that, I think that makes sense. It, you know, it looks like this. I hope that the other, if you send us a rendering from the other side, it doesn't look like this whatsoever. Um, Got it. And to, but it's to also the place where a, a personal safety concern could be the most apparent uh, for an individual person that is walking by themselves at night between the freeway that no one's paying attention to them and this closed parking lot that no one's paying attention to. Them. That could be a really unsafe place for an individual to walk their dog. That's fair. So I, I think it's, if it's a place that the residents are supposed to use, we need to make sure that that's a safe place. Well, you need to make sure that's a safe place, but we need to make sure our zoning does things like this. It just requires a higher level of consideration where we're using a zone that like hasn't been tested in this context at all. And I, I'm fully supportive of us making those considerations because I don't think we have all the tools that we need in our zoning ordinance. Um, but we just have to be more careful on this. So just to continue on my train of thought, I, I, this rendering, since you know, you show us the rendering and we have a million questions because of it, yeah. uh, and they're all very good questions and comments. I, uh, trees is an important one to me. I only see a few there. I hope that if you end up doing this, there is a wall of trees between this and the, and, and the structure uh, and the freeway, and the, between the freeway and the structure, but all around. Um, and uh, I, I also read about outdoor filtration, uh, you know, air filters. Um, I want you to uh, be creative about this um, and not only put uh, these fancy filters in the units, um, which is basically you, you're basically putting a box where someone will exchange a filter, and those filters cost a lot of money. The thicker ones cost a lot of money, so you're basically sending the the cost of the filtration to the to the person leasing the unit. Um, I I wonder if there is a way of being creative about this to make sure that there is adequate. Uh, if this project were to move forward, um, it, and again, I'm supportive in, in in general terms about this and the density in the area. But I also want to make sure that we're not sending the higher cost to the person leasing it. If there is a creative way to either discount these big, thick filters that we, we, they're going to put on the units and whatnot. Um, and uh, you mentioned bedroom counts, and that made me wonder. What is your current breakdown on that, at, at least how it is at the moment? So we're modeling it currently. We have 25% being two-bedroom units, about a component of, of, we don't have the final number, but we have committed to ha include three bedroom units as well. And then the balance would be one bedroom and then some studio as well. But So the primary would be the one bedroom unit and we can bring a breakdown because we've still been getting some comments from people as we've had discussions about whether we're getting the right count. Yeah. But that would be a detail we'd be happy to put into the development agreement so that it meets to everyone, everyone's satisfaction. And, and just the last thought, uh, I, when you're talking about the commercial, uh, you might struggle. Uh, we've seen we've seen this a lot and all across the city. You might struggle to find a tenant, um, and I want you to also uh, not to throw your hands. And I'm talking in general to the, all the developers, right? You know, and you happen to be in front of me, but not to throw your hands over there and say, "Oh, no one is renting it," right? So I want us to be creative about as far as like what level of discount you're willing to offer for that space that we're talking about an amenity that we need in the area and is the uh -huh. chicken or the egg as far as like, how do you make that need happen and whatnot? Maybe there is a way of getting creative about as far as uh, the rent for that space that we know is going to be an amenity for those hundreds of people in there. And we don't necessarily want them to go uh, a couple miles away uh, to buy eggs, they could just buy it right there, right? And maybe someone wants to buy water across this because they're playing sports. Uh, hopefully, they just buy it right there. So, um, that, those are my initial thoughts. Those Thank are you. great questions. And, Council Member, if I can just respond to just that real quickly, I, just because this is going to be an owner uh, managed and run facility versus something that's going to be sold to a REIT, I think there is opportunity to, to do discounts and, and subsidies to the retail until it matures. Uh, is a part of the development as well. Okay, I guess we'll, I'll just let um, the public and the applicant know where my brain is at right now. I, I want to study this a lot more, but my thought is as opposed to most rezone requests where I'm, I'm really trying hard not to look at 
the development plan in terms of whether or not I'm going to support this. It, I'm trying to look at does that zone make sense for the neighborhood context. Mm -hmm. I, I may be viewing this one a little bit differently and I may want a lot more assurances as to what the development plan is going to be and how we're going to make sure that that's enforceable and I'm not exactly sure the tool or how that's going to be and if it's going to require some upfront architecture costs and urban design like whatever plant landscape plans um, because it is so unique that I think that I think I have to look at this one a little differently than I'd look at a different one um, Council members, are we good to move on? Thank you okay. for being here. For Thank you for, it. Thanks. for our best discussion. Um, we are going to skip item number three, move that to a different day. And so we're on item number four, budget amendment number one for fiscal year 23-24. Council members, are we good to keep going through this and then go to our break? Let's do that. Anyone dying? Of Okay, let's go to item number four. Uh, ben Ludke from Council, our Council Policy Analyst staff is going to key this up, and then we have Mary Beth Tom this Thompson here, our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the first briefing for Budget Amendment Number One. The public hearing is scheduled for September fifth. There are 10 items in the budget amendment. This includes a revenue reduction of over $2.1 million and over $14.8 million in expenditures. Most of those expenditures are a reappropriation for new vehicles. So this is an item you see each year where previous appropriations for vehicles that were unable to be encumbered under a contract. Basically, the manufacturer was not accepting orders. So the vehicles are still needed, but the funding needs to be reappropriated in the new fiscal year. So once the manufacturer begins accepting orders, the money is there to make the purchase. So it's really not, this is expenses that have been, has just been moved from previous fiscal years forward. So it's not an additional expense. It's just uh, because it's been moving, it's been moving forward. It's, it's a reappropriation. Just reappropriation, right? Yeah. Correct. That's most of the expense in this budget amendment. Uh, there is a quarter million dollars from the general fund balance as well as a new expense. Uh, we received new information today about fund balance. Uh, I sent an email last night, uh, so that is now outdated. Can we get uh, displayed on the screen the chart on page three of the staff report. This shows the fund balance projection. And if we could zoom in a little bit on the right side. So in the blue section, you will see a little bit near the middle an item called expense changes. And it's eight and a half million dollars. Uh, these expense changes were not included in the annual budget fund balance projections. What we learned today is the eight and a half million is incorrect. It's actually 2.2 million. And this is good news because it means that there is more available in general fund balance. So that would actually be just above 13%, which is the minimum target the council has identified. Now, those projections that you're looking at don't include two important things. So each year at the end of the fiscal year, unused budgets drop to fund balance, which increases the percentage. That's not included in these projections. It also doesn't include revenues coming in higher than budgeted, since when the council adopts the annual budget, we don't have the actual revenues for the last few months of the fiscal year. So that would also increase fund balance. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Beth, who has a little bit more context on why this changed. So um, when I was looking today through um, our ACFR, um, I noticed that the what it's called is non-spendable. That number has changed. Um, so it went from the 8.5 down to the 2.2. The 8.5 included accounts receivable and taxes receivable 
GASB has changed that standard and it only includes our prepaid numbers now. So that's why it went from 8.5 to 2.2. Could you speak a little louder? Is that better? Okay. So um, GASB changed the ruling in our ACFR and we used to include... That's a lot of acronyms I don't know. GASB. Um, Government Accounting Standards Board a changed for our financial statements. Um, the requirements for non-spendable funds, we used to include accounts receivable and taxes receivable. We no longer include those. We only include prepaid expenses. Who, who's the right person to translate that for us? <laughs> Can I take a stab okay, yes, at it? Um, we were grateful that Ben noticed this and asked about it, and it was important to get it figured out before today, and Mary Beth was uh, kind enough to work together with Ben and Jennifer and get it figured out. But essentially, it looked like, based on how it was originally reported, it looked like we had less than 13% in fund balance. Fortunately, based on a number of factors, we really have 13 point something. 0 0.06. Okay, in fund balance. So this is, um, I mean, to me, I thought it was great because uh, they noticed, they worked together, they figured it out, and, um, and now we're okay. So we're okay is okay. the summary. We're okay. Thank you. That's what I, thank you. <laughs> I, I try really hard to not talk accounting. I try. Sometimes You're just I don't, like on another level of, of intelligence than Sometimes than I just miss this. it. Sometimes <laughs> I never apologize for your brilliance, Mary Beth. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Do we need to go through the items one by one? Um, yes, I'll go through the items one by one. Okay. Uh, and in the next budget amendment, we will have an updated fund balance chart reflecting Great. what we just talked about. Thank you. And there, there are two items where the administration is requesting straw polls. Um, they happen to be the first two items. So I'll jump to those right now. Item A1, this is a donation. Is there a different screen we should be looking at? Yes, so there's a map for this item. Page five, that's it. So this is a donation of $218,000, and it is being added to an existing CIP project. The council approved $300,000 in CIP last year to add lighting to the northeast ball field at Riverside Park next to the Jordan River. It's the red marker on the map. The donation will allow the project to also add lighting to the adjacent baseball field, uh, the northwest one, just left of the red marker. The total project budget is $518,000. And the administration requested a straw poll to allow for receipt of the contract for the larger, the entire project. The funds still couldn't be committed until the council votes on this item. So um, if I'm translating that for the public, this is not actually spending any more taxpayer dollars. It's allowing us to receive a donation from a private company in order to put into this park to light both fields instead of just one. Correct. But we have to officially, so, okay. Uh, am I allowed, I pro, I'm allowed to propose straw polls. Sure. Chair, right? or I propose I can, a straw poll that, oh, go ahead, Councilor Dugan. I propose straw poll that we uh, allow the, the donation of $218,000 for the Northeast Ballpark Field Lighting Program. Okay, that's unanimous in the, in the positive. Okay. So that takes us to item A2. This is a request for an additional $250,000 for the Downtown Open Streets event this fall. The council approved half a million dollars in budget amendment number five last fiscal year. That was back in the spring. That money was limited to holding the event in the summer. Because of the rollback of pandemic regulations, it's become more difficult to hold this event. So holding the event in the summer was proving difficult. The council reappropriated that half million dollars to allow the funding to be used for the event in the fall. This is an additional 250,000, so the total budget 
would be $750,000. The additional funding is mostly for purchasing street infrastructure instead of renting it. Uh, this was something the council discussed during the annual budget. And can we get the table uh, comparing? That's the one. So you'll see in this table in the middle column the estimates from earlier in the year. And the column on the right is the current estimates. Now there are some differences. The, the event this fall is for eight weeks, not the 15 weeks that has been held the last few years. It's also not including Thursday this fall. It would be limited to Fridays and Saturdays. It's still on Main Street from South Temple down to 400 South. And Main Street would be closed from noon until 2 a.m. Fridays and Saturdays for eight weeks this fall. The biggest expense changes, the first line item, you'll see there's zero for temporary infrastructure rentals. And in the middle of the chart, you'll see $200,000 for UTA tracks barriers and a contingency. So these are the, the bollards that can be uh, put into the concrete and then not needed. The administration stated that these temporary infrastructure elements would be available to other special events. One of the policy questions is, would it be first come, first serve? Would it be market rate? Would it be discounted? How would that work since we haven't done that before as a city? The other uh, line item to call out is you'll see activation and programming third from the top. So this increased from 45,000 to 185,000. So even though it's a shorter event of eight weeks instead of 15, there's a higher level of activation and programming that's proposed. So uh, every block would have some kind of activity going on uh, and a street market was mentioned as one of the ideas. Uh, if you'd like more information on what the public could mm -hmm. see, what this could look like, uh, that's something we can ask the administration for. Mr. Chair. Councilor, please. I would definitely like some more information on that. It seems like a big jump on that issue, oh. on, the, on that one. I, as, you, as you probably remember, I've been talking a lot about the not renting things in the, in the Main Street, so it's good to see that. Uh, but but that, I see the activation and programming to, to be a big large jump that i have many many questions about so i would love to yeah know more we're going to be we're going to close the street for 35 percent of the number of days 35.5 percent of the number of days that we did the previous year and that's going to multiply by five no 45 to 185 so it's like five to four anyway it's a lot more <laughs> uh councilman baltimore did you have a question um, and then um, Petro. I have two questions, two things. When does it start again? So the question number one, like when are we starting this? Pro Do you know when it starts in the fall? What's the fall? Uh, Is it I don't have an exact start okay. date. If someone knows, I welcome them to jump up and share. <laughs> Here's Peter. Peter from Economic Development. Right, am I heard? There we go. Uh, so this year, the the event will take place September fifteenth through October twenty eighth. To October what? Sorry. October twenty eighth. Okay, great. Then the second question is, the um, trucks barrier. What does it look like? <laughs> the one that we're going to buy. Is it pretty? Uh, yeah. Please I think don't we're, tell me it's orange. We're, it it's like not it's, orange. Okay. Uh, it'll right. be. Uh, we're using state of the art, uh, black. Uh, bollards uh, that will line both sides of tracks and then we're using white chain uh, uh, to link them I think it's gonna look very attractive uh, I will say it was it, it was difficult to get to this solution working with all city departments uh, involved uh, specifically fire um, but we're uh, really happy and excited about it. Really much those be than the temper the sandbags and yes oh, sandbags, okay. will those be permanent like yes. they'll stay up no matter what. They will be up that all barrier year long. is helpful even in, when it, the street's not closed. Council member Young, and the, oh sorry, Councilman Peter, and then Young. So that begs the question: Are we really confident that the study and the constituent feedback is going to come back that we're going to permanently change this to a pedestrian street? Like, 
I definitely like owning over than rather than renting. But if we're not sure, that feels like a pretty significant increase in expenses. And like I, I'm torn on it, but I mean, we had problems finding an operator this year, right? Like the operator didn't want to do it for as many weeks. Is that the reason why we were delayed? Uh, the reason we were delayed uh, was partially due to funding. We didn't have a source of funding before city council was kind enough to uh, appropriate money towards the event. Uh, in order for us to plan and to put in this more permanent infrastructure, we needed more time. Um, we're, we're right up against it, but uh, we're, we're very confident uh, that it's all going to happen on time this year, and we're really excited. But if you want to think... Can, can I understand sorry. your question a little better? Yeah, we're just putting permanent things in that might not have a function outside of this particular use, like the shutting down of the street. And we've said that we want to study this new pedestrian mall. And if I had my way, I'd wave my magic wand, and that's what we would do. But we have public processes. And if we run into any sort of problems, is this level of investment still worth it? Are we? Well, it's still, there's still a benefit to separating cars from being able to make a U turn over tracks, which I'll admit in the public I have done. I know that's not allowed, have. but like it's it's really it's really like easy to to cross into tracks when it really shouldn't be anyway, right? So I, I think that the barriers would have some function. It might not be worth the two hundred thousand if it was just for that situation, but given that it can serve multiple purposes, I don't. It's not like it's a bad thing to have up. Two years it pays for itself. In two years it pays for itself. In two times. Yeah. yeah. Councilmember Young had a had. A no question. Um, so just two follow-ups. Um, when you say it's a one-time purchase, do you have any sort of expectation for the longevity of that purpose or that purchase? Like, do we think they'll last a year, two years? Uh, they they should hopefully last much longer than that. There will be ongoing operation and maintenance uh, for the system, but we expect it to be robust enough to stay for years. Perfect. Moving and then my other follow-up was just related to um, the additional details related to the activation and the programming. I think one of the pieces that I'd also be interested in is what type of feedback are we receiving and gathering related to that programming. So this could be a, we're going to try a lot of new things for this upcoming year with the intention of then being able to define which are really community benefits. Um, it would be helpful for me to understand what that data collection piece is like. Absolutely, and we we did conduct a survey uh, before hosting this year's event. Activations were one of the main issues that were pointed out. We were again running on kind of a, sh a small budget, uh, so act we didn't have a whole lot of activations outside of the patios and some buskers and artists on the street. You're going to see a much different event this year. Um, uh, one of those issues were that some of the other blocks felt like they weren't being activated enough. We have one block with a lot of restaurants and bars, and so we're hoping to spread the love down the entire street this year and really show the public what this can be. Yeah, I have. there's a lot of questions. Are they related to activations? Um, a little bit. Okay, go ahead, because I have more questions no, on I'm, I'm just, I'm, I was hoping, I'm not sure if you guys are working on this, but obviously the construction on 200 South has a lot of people like nervous and has this construction fatigue, so, and I also know that the northern part of the, the business on the northern part kind of feel excluded in a way because of the construction than the southern group. Are you guys with this new $185,000 for the programming and activation, are you guys planning on doing even an extra effort to, you know, to, uh, what you call like to um, mitigate some of that construction fatigue or the construction issues that are preventing people from going to those businesses? We're hoping that the activations that we have planned are going to draw more people this year. So uh, we did run into issues with some of those larger blocks with more missing teeth, so to say, like the Galvin block, um, uh, the Eccles block. Uh, we'll be a activating those in a more intentful way this year uh, and really creating a destination for folks uh, uh, this year who want to participate in the event, whereas we really didn't have a whole lot on the street in previous years. Right, thanks. But we have, and on that construction, we've been talking with Dominion and uh, staying uh, up to date with them because that will cross right through right. Uh, Main Street here uh, if it hasn't already. Um, but they were, it's expected not to interfere with the event. Councilor Wharton. 
Um, my question is about the bollards, like as well. So these go, these run alongside the tracks. Okay. And what about the like closing the street to the traffic part? So for the street closure, okay. uh, we'll be using rollable bollards uh, that, that can be rolled in and out of the street. Uh, they're made of concrete. They're very heavy. Um, but uh, that was the solution uh, that was come to you by uh, our fire department, police department, and streets uh, that would work for them. We're, we, we, have, we need to make sure that they have quick and easy access to the street if there is an emergency. And so uh, we'll be using a, a rollable bollard that will line each intersection. And then, um, and then yes, a chain and bollard uh, system that will go both sides of the street along tracks, basically in that rumble strip uh, that's right next to the double yellow line. But not the fences for that part either, too? No. Okay. Um, okay. We are asked to make a straw poll on this. Uh, that was the request. Uh, since there are many questions, we could look at a follow-up briefing, getting more information if the council would feel more comfortable. Council members, I will say I'm comfortable... Um, with a straw poll for everything but the activation and programming. And the reason for that is this is, in my mind, the same thing that I think Councilman Peachard just mentioned, an idea of eventually we'd like Main Street to be more of a pedestrian. Well, I think there's appetite to consider Main Street becoming more of a pedestrian mall permanently that would help economic development, help a, a pedestrian atmosphere downstairs, downtown, downstairs, downtown. But I really don't think we can, like, if that's dependent on $185,000 for 16 days, I don't even know the math there, but that's a lot of money per day for activation. Like, we're not going to be continually subsidizing performers in order to do that if it becomes permanent. So I want to do this in a way that we're, we're making it as though it were permanent so that we could then transition to, to, to be permanent. So if the plan only works with $185,000 for 16 days of activation, then I don't think it's, then I don't, I don't know that I want to do it, but um, it, so I would be comfortable with all of the other pieces, except for I'm not yet comfortable with that. Those costs do include some permanent uh, fixtures that come along with those activations, just to keep in mind. So a lot of it but will be reusable. Um, well, I, yeah, but I don't think we should be using taxpayer dollars to pay performers to come support specific businesses. I, I do think we should design our streets, our public infrastructure, in a way that supports the businesses. But I'm not sure that we should, Mr. Chair, that, I, do I, that forever. Could we? So the 45 that was requested before for the activation and programming, or, or that was intended for the 15 weeks. Uh, will there be appetite to keep that level of funding uh, instead of the 85, um, keep the 45, and then the rest of the changes uh, as there are on the eight-week program? Will there be appetite to, to keep it at that level? Well, I would take it down to $16,000 since it's about $1,000 a day that we had la last year, according to that figure. Just the um, last year we had 45 days and it was forty five right thousand dollars so that would be the same amount right yeah. so it would take it down to sixteen thousand i i think i'm with the chair i'd like to see more about what this activation and programming means and i really like okay i can be talked into the permanence of the safety there it's probably good that's where we've got a lot of young people drinking and walking it's probably a good safety measure anyway yeah. um but I don't know until we get constituent feedback and a plan if we should be buying structures and, and and things for this use. It, it feels a little bit like constituent feedback at that point is tokenized, and it feels like on um, if they don't want this, that we have not invested wisely. I, I would. Mr. Hey, we have a, I have a lot of yeah. yeah. Mr. Chair, first of all, I, I agree that. It seems like $185,000 for the activation seems quite a lot for eight weeks. But I would say that if you're activating and make this permanent, then you don't have to do that because it's now permanent and it's all it's an ongoing issue. So realize it's like this is a very first step one, and then after you do three or four steps, it, I, the price and the cost goes down. So just, just We can argue different yeah, points yeah. of that issue. But, but I also just but, want to say that I think the idea also here of uh, – you know, the constituent, we have shown that this activation of the street has done a lot for downtown. 
this has we have shown over the last couple of years that this has done an amazing job to activate the street and activate downtown sales tax and activate the living down there so we have seen that happen so i'm okay with some of these costs because also year over year the price is going to be less and the the activation is going to go up so i'm i'm i feel comfortable there i do understand the the constituent stuff but we've shown over the last couple of years that the activation has been uh shown greatly for sales tax and street act. Yeah, we're in the news because of that. So, you know, nationwide news. So I'm I'm not wor super worried about it, but I think you guys have a really good PowerPoint presentation. So I think the illustration of, you know, showing us what, showing the council what it looks like, what, what it used to look like and what's going to look like now with the new equipment and all of the things might be really good for our visuals because it's kind of like, we can only, right now, I think we'd only see, I can only see the orange construction crappy. I'm like, uh, and then you tell me chains and like, well, it's okay, but I'm a little nervous at the same time. So I feel like if we could see that at the next meeting or whatever, or in, uh, in an email, maybe that could ease our doubts. But then also this is a point that I've been bringing up for a long time. I would like to start seeing, and I'm not sure how we can do this, when we invest in a certain area of town, like what we've done for two, three years, we see it in the news, obviously, and we can see it, in, but I would like to see it more specifically in terms of sales taxes or whatever it is, or, or business feedback, and you know, to say, hey, this is what has happened. You invested $700,000, but in return, you got $2 million worth of whatever that is, so that we can start looking at our investments in that way. Like, what's the return of our, on our investment? Um, otherwise, it's still kind of like, yeah, it was good, you know, but I, do we really want to do another $200,000, you know? So it, just if I, if I could make some comments, I really appreciate everything that everyone has said. I think this is, we're all trying to do the right thing for our Salt Lake City and our downtown. One of the reasons we came back to you to ask for the additional funding is for the infrastructure. I believe it was Council Member Pui who actually said, we're investing on temporary, it looks like a construction zone. Um, we agree with you 100%. And this is why we have engaged with our um, all of our city departments, fire, police, and have actually have had a great committee that has worked through all these issues. Um, Definitely open street is something that has brought a lot of economic impact into the area. We had a meeting today, we saw uh, Visit Salt Lake, and they're gonna be looking at, from the time period, how much is coming in. Um, I hope that you've seen an article, I think Mary Beth, you send us some statistical data that shows that Salt Lake City is number one in terms of recovery because of the pedestrian activity that's happening downtown. Um, in terms of the activation, yes, you're absolutely right. It, the price seems to go very high. There has been, since we started this project, costs have increased dramatically, even for performers. Um, we are, because of what you describe in terms of block one, two, three, and four, and by that I mean from South Temple to 400 South, we're adding a market that will be available. Uh, we're adding different things to the different parts of the main street that we're talking but, about. But Lorena, why are we adding those things? Uh, what we saw from some of the information we received is that block one, which I'm talking about, uh, city, uh, our mall up there, they wanted to have more activities that would reflect kind of like the spirit of that block and the same thing with block two and three and four, that they have different personalities, if you don't mind if I use that term. So that's what we're hoping to do. Is the goal to get the people that visit open streets evenly spread among the blocks at all times that's of the absolutely. night? Absolutely. I'm not sure I agree with that goal. That's one. I think the goal is to support the businesses that exist there. I could be, my mind could get changed, but I'm not yet sure. in agreement that the goal is to have all the people evenly spread between all the blocks. I, I think that's... Am I wrong on that, council members? I, I, Chris, had a, Chris had a comment. For Go ahead, um, Chris. Councilman Warden. I mean, isn't, I, 
to me, it sounds like that's the easiest way to ensure that we're supporting all of the businesses and that we're keeping it consistently active. Like people aren't going to walk. If one block is dead and you see that like there's nothing happening on that block, you're going to turn around and go back. Um, if you see that there's activity, you're going to keep walking. So to me, I, it's, to me, it makes sense. But what I was going to say before that is I don't really mind. Uh, I think it's too soon to say that 185,000 is too much. Cause I don't know what we're getting for it. I don't, I can't say it's too much or not enough or whatever. Um, and, and I'd like to know what, you know, what we are getting for it, but I will say like having been on, being on main street a lot and, and having my law firm on main street and walking on main street every day. Um, I think that we have had, um, in the past, like our efforts to, to close down and do open streets have been good. And there have been some activation things that have been like cute and fun, but I, I think that it has, there's been opportunity for improvement, um, and for it to be like a more serious investment. And I, and I don't, I definitely think I'm not advocating that we shouldn't scrutinize high numbers that come in front of us. We should, but I also, I'm not sure that like, I don't want to have another discussion. I don't want us to go down the, another road of like fireworks or Muzak, Muzak. You know what I mean? Like, w- like I don't want to waste like an hour arguing over, okay, uh, like thirty thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars that somewhere else we would easily spend um, without taken. questioning. So, like, I just don't think it's that crazy until we hear what the plan is. Um, Councilor Petro. And I think we should be open to it. So okay. first of all, I contend the fireworks were great because we got the drone show. And did you see that? That was an improvement. All right. It, so first of was, all, it was, no moment cost, is wasted in positive conflict. All right. We were like cost, 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 cost. <laughs> yeah. Um, but second of all, um, this is going to show my hand and how I spend my time on Main Street. Um, are we talking about full day activations now? Typically, I'm there on an evening meeting a friend for a nice dinner and a drink and, you know, hanging out on Main Street. But we're talking about a full, because I was thinking, you know, the block's closer to four, three and 400 south. At that time, that's where the things are open. Nothing in the City Creek area is open when you're out at 11 o'clock at night. There's a, there's a bar and a couple of coffee shops. So, so we're talking, we're talking about full day activations, this market that you're talking about and all that. Yes. So we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, activities, uh, planned for both Fridays and Saturdays from noon till 2 AM. So, uh, uh, and like Lorena mentioned, uh, each block is different. Uh, there's businesses on each block, but some don't have as many as others. And, uh, I think ultimately, uh, the business community, and this was from their feedback, felt that those blocks that didn't have the good cluster of businesses felt left out. And they felt that there was nothing drawing people to their business. And so we're hoping that with these additional activations, like a market, um, and a lot more, and we're very excited to share it with you, um, uh, it will disperse the people to those other businesses that maybe didn't get as much attention in previous years. Did I see Councilmember Young? Did you have your hand up? No. Uh, is there a council member that wants to propose a straw poll? I would like to propose a straw poll, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Poit. That uh, we, you know, it seems like to me that we have a lot of questions about activation and programming pending that, and we put that one on, on hold for a minute. We approve the rest of the, of the proposed changes. Does that work for you or for... Mary Beth or Ben? Um, I would say last year you allocated and allow us to have 500,000. We've already entered into negotiations with the Downtown Alliance. It's been an amendment already signed. Uh, I would say we would love to bring back to you what the activation will be. Yeah. Uh, we're so close to it. Today is the 15th of August. We will, this is supposed to kick off on September 15th. And so the, that's a tight deadline, but we will do whatever we can. So does the this is my proposal, right? Like that, that we put in a whole uh, line item um, pending yeah. more information. And my my clarifying question to that, which is what I just I, I like that. What my clarifying question is: 
if we if you don't have the hundred eighty five thousand dollars for activation, does the agreement that you signed with Downtown Alliance or whomever is going to do this f fall completely? Do, is are all the other pieces of this program dependent on the activations? Um, we're I, the answer is yes. I mean, without activation, we don't have we don't have an event. We don't have open streets, and they've had to plan for for all the activities beforehand. But, uh, but, but you could still do the, impro okay. the improvements to oh, the yeah, streets. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there is some things that could Oh, I guess happen. I didn't understand the question. There was two part in terms of the construction. Okay. Yeah, the the, sh so. the barriers and oh, no, the, we, all the other things. Mm -hmm. Can we do that without, without and still take some time to decide on the activations? Um, no. What do you think? You're, you've been working with a construction company. I don't see how we could possibly do that given that we're not meeting the next three Tuesdays. So like, if you all want to come call a meeting we and come back and hear the presentation, it. then, and have staff do that, I'm I think forced. we just give them the money and just say, yeah. it better be good. Yeah, Council, um, Council Member Warchick is correct. And if it's, and if if it's, it's not, start, then sorry, sorry. next year, you might not get any. We are kissing 13% oh. with, with expenses coming up. Okay, but it's penny wise. We're being penny wise and pound foolish. Like we're arguing over this amount of money, and what else is it going to go towards? I mean, what are we taking it from? Uh, the next crisis that pops up in twenty four seconds uh, is not. If if the next thing come, that pops up costs a hundred thousand dollars or one hundred thirty thousand dollars, it's not a crisis. Yeah, being over thirteen percent is a commitment that we I made. Think that, I understand that. So I think that we have questions, and maybe maybe there is appetite uh, on, the, on the council right now to approve maybe mm -hmm. uh, this. Yes. Um, but we definitely have a lot of questions about the activation. We really want the so we want, we want the administration to maybe give us quite a bit of information about the, what the activation and programming is, and if they can find some savings on that one hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars, and what those savings could, could be. I think that's something that I'm willing to. Uh, to propose right now. I don't know if we can call the question on that. So to procedurally, approve it, Procedurally, can Second. Council Member Warren propose an alternative straw poll yeah. to do the whole thing? And yeah, we can see just, if that passes. Just yeah. make sure it's worth it, because if it isn't, and you guys come... Are you, are you proposing that, Council Yeah, Member? it is. And I'll just say, like, you know, if we come back in after eight weeks, and it was bad, and it was a bad investment, then that may mean we're not doing this again. You will not be very happy with me, that's for sure. I'm okay with that. Okay, okay Council Member Wharton's straw poll is to approve the whole thing. Yeah. I'm a no. You know, if you've never had a pay gap, you can say stuff like that, but I've only ever made 55 cents on the dollar. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that may be okay, true. that passes oh, five to jobs. two with Council Members Petro and Mono as oh, the guess. opposing votes. Can we move on now? All right, we're moving on to our break. We, oh, sorry. Can we cover the rest of the budget amendment items later, or do we need to go through them tonight? No. Uh, the other items are not urgent, so whenever it's good okay. for the council's time. Great, thank you. We will go move on to our break. Let's take, can we cut it to 15 minutes, council members? Okay, 15 minutes, we'll be back at 4.40. <laughs> I, I got to use the restroom. Um, we are going to jump. There's been a lot of things changing rapidly and changing again. So what we're going to do is move on to item number six in our work session agenda. And then um, we're going to, after that, we, I think we're, gonna, we're planning to break for a closed session. So uh, because we have representatives here that need to leave, we'll jump into that. This item number six is a resolution about the Ivory House public benefits analysis. Allison Rowland from council policy staff will give us an introduction. We have Mary Beth Thompson here as well as available for questions representatives from the applicant or. And I believe Blake Thomas will be online. Okay. I'm not sure if our, if our connections are up or not, but I'll begin. Um, so, as you mentioned, this, is a, this item is a review of a public benefit analysis for a project that would provide 465 units of new student housing at the University of Utah. The public benefit analysis was conducted by the Finance Department. 
and the project is already under construction at 434 South Mario Capecchi Drive. The developer is Ivory University House L3C, which it, the L3C refers to a low profit limited liability company. So it's a, it's a form of company that is somewhere between a private and a nonprofit company. The public, an, the public benefit analysis assessed whether Salt Lake City should waive impact and permit fees and provide refunds for fees the project has already paid. The public benefit analysis concludes that, quote, while the project is not income restricted, it will be rent restricted and will address critical affordable housing needs of students, end quote. The amount waived or refunded would total just over $2.4 million, and in return, Ivory University House would pledge $2.4 million over a period of 10 years to fund need-based scholarships administered by the University of Utah and reserved for Salt Lake City students. There will be a public hearing on this item on September 5th. I apologize, it's marked as September 1st in the staff report, but by that I meant 5th. And um, the, there is potential action on September 9th. Hi, Mary Beth, I think your mic is off, but did you volunteer me up? I'm happy to say a couple words. No, go ahead, Blake. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, thank you, I'm Blake Thomas, Director of Community and Neighborhoods Department. I'll sure. keep my comments very brief to avoid redundancy with Allison's great introduction. Thanks, Allison. Um, today, the administration is requesting a building permit and impact fee waiver for Ivory University House. Um, which, as she mentioned, is a student housing project providing 465 apartments of various sizes, as well as community rooms, classrooms, outdoor study areas. It's also a three minute walk to a track station and five minute walk to the Student Life Center, uh, relieving campus congestion and vehicle miles traveled is one benefit of the project. Additionally, rent will be restricted at 30% of monthly income for a single person household of 80% AMI or below, and that will be enforced through a 30 year land use restrictive agreement or deed restriction. To further assist with affordability, Ivory University House has committed that no less than 25% of residents in the project will receive additional housing assistance and Ivory University House has pledged that uh, if the $2.4 million in fees are refunded, it will pledge scholarships uh, funded by the operations of the project in an amount equal to the fees waived over the 10 years. Um, they've also committed that the scholarships will be based on need and for Salt Lake City residents only. And lastly, I'll just say that student housing is in immense demand in our community. And University of Utah undergraduate enrollment is projected to grow to 40,000 students over the next seven years. Um, and the university will need about 10,000 housing units to allow one of every four students to live on campus. So thank you for the consideration of the res this request. I'm happy to turn it over to Mary Beth or council and answer any questions that you might have. The only thing I'd like to say, Council, is that um, this is in Budget Amendment Number One. This request, as a as a reduction of revenue mm -hmm. for the refund for both impact fees and the general fund, um, we usually don't put a budget amendment in for refunds. But because of the size of these refunds, we decided to complete a budget amendment as well. Okay, Council Members. Councilman Wharton. So, uh, can you just, um, like, can you just say again what you said? I think it was like the last substantive line of your presentation that that the amount that we're giving back equal would be equal to was it the scholarship amount for for ten years or for, and was that just the scholarships or? So sorry, can you just say that line again? Sure, no problem. So the fee waiver requested from the building permit fees and impact fees is 2.4 million. And so Ivory University House is committing to take that amount um, and to fund student scholarships with a new scholarship fund, um, the Ivory University House Scholarship Fund over 10 years. So $2.4 million of student scholarships need-based for Salt Lake City residents over the next 10 years. 
Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Council members, any additional questions? Council member Valdemoros. I still can't remember, or if maybe I missed, didn't hear you guys, but I don't, I don't understand how this came to be. This is something new that we've never done. Did, how did this happen? Like, did they come over and said, hey, you guys have charged us for this, but now we realize that we would like to do scholarships. Can you refund that? Well, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like understand sure. why we're here. Sure, I'd be happy to um, take a stab at that one. As Allison mentioned in her um, introduction, the Ivory University House entity is a L3C. Um, and traditionally, when we do these waivers, you would have it go through the HAB board and a 5013C. So this project was a bit of a square peg in a round hole in which student housing is not allowed to access um, traditional affordable housing incentives like LIHTC and also the um, L3C status uh, had them kind of outside of our plain language of our ordinance with our typical waivers that we do based on the income or rent restrictions that they're placing on the project. So typically it would be formulaic and would run through something like the HAP board. This is the vehicle uh, for a unique project that uh, we really need in our community. So that's how we wound up here in uh, taking this path. And it's just um, we really appreciate Ivory for also being willing to say that if we are refunded, then we're going to commit dollar for dollar um, scholarships. Okay, thank you. I like that. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, Councilmember Dugan. So originally, when we I remember we had the proposal and the uh, the lease is from the uh, the church is leasing the property to Ivory, uh, and the, the development was for a uh, scholarship. Uh, residents and you know I would say the word scholarship because everybody in there would be on a, some type of a scholarship from the University of Ivory so is this 2.4 million dollars in addition to the other scholarships that the residents would be receiving because I was always in the impression that all of these students in the residency were on some type of a scholarship there is a scholarship fund that was created that was seeded with $6 million. The 2.4 would be in addition to that. Um, I know that Annalise is in the audience with Ivory in case there's any clarification, but my understanding is that um, there's 25% of the units in which um, Ivory University House is willing to provide additional assistance. Um, the fund would be um, needs-based scholarships and not necessarily, it's my understanding that not necessarily every uh, e bedroom would be utilizing a scholarship. And, and this, I mean, the, the construction has already started and the building's supposed to, I don't know when it's supposed to open up this fiscal year or this probably next, next school year or so. And so there's already going to be 500, I'm going to say 500 students living in the building. Uh, so it, it's already going to be activated, and I love that. I love being right next to schools. You don't need a car. Don't don't Im impact the traffic, and it's a perfect place. To, you know, you should be students should be on campus or right next to campus, and this is awesome for that. I, that's appreciated very much. I'm just curious if the when we had the initial discussions, the initial discussions didn't talk about any impact fee waivers, and I, and I just am curious curious at at, at the the end game where we're already now we're asking for impact fees adjustments the buildings there the scholarships are already set in place and we're already moving ahead and it, uh at the same time this is a great program but it's also not a full non-profit organization so i just i'm i like it but i also have just uh concerns in my head about that uh portion or uh, of that contract mary beth I have a question. Um, if not for this agreement, how fast does, like, how many years, when does the impact fee need to be paid? At issuance of permit? And so that has that already been paid? It has. All, and yes, both this of would these be a refund paid. of that. And it's paid in full at issuance of permit. Right. Okay. Yeah, both of these have already been paid, both permits and impact fees. So, um, 
Okay. So I'm looking at this, if I'm looking, if I'm, I, I'm not saying I am looking at this, if I'm looking at this from a purely financial standpoint, it's as though we're saying, okay, you don't, we're going to refund this amount of money and you're going to pay that back to us with 0% interest over a period of 10 years in the form of providing scholarships to our students, not, not in the form of cash repayments. We're saying, so it's a 25,000, 25, 2.5, how much is it again? 2.5 million. 2.5 million dollar, 10 year term, 0% interest loan with repayments in the form of scholarships. Is that like accurate what I just said? Okay, so do we think that that's, that's worth, I mean like that's the question we're being asked. Is, is, that, is that a deal we want? Okay. But Council Member Wharton. Also in addition, the other deal is the rent restrictions, right? That's part of the deal. Correct. So yeah. the rent restrictions are, are not going to happen, but for this, this agreement. Like, correct. like is saying correct. Okay. And, so, okay. Wait, I thank you. One more question. Councilman Warren, go ahead. In in that paragraph about rent restrictions, it says, however, unlike HUD units, these would not be income restricted, but it talks in the preceding language about how it is restricted to 80% AMI. So what is, does that mean it wouldn't be income restricted in that the income can come from any source? No, I think what it means is that it's set as though someone making 80% AMI could afford it, uh -huh. but they're not going to income qualify any of these people. But it says Correct. income restricted. Yeah, income restricted units means that the, the tenant has to fall in that income bracket. Income setting the rent to match an income level uh -huh. is just the number that they put on the bill up for rent. Got it. Okay. And even though this is on in University Park, this is on land owned by the church, and this isn't technically part of the university. Correct. Correct. Officially. Yeah, because we have legally. to rezone it. Got and it. Stuff. Okay. And in the understood. This is probably facet type income because a student, full time student, is probably not making anything close to eighty percent AMI. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that's sure. what I I mean. We just that's what I'm struggling with is like what. It's just, it's really like way above the student, an average student's, 30% of an average student's income. So does that additional income rent restriction matter? It's going to be whatever students can afford to pay, right? Is what they're going to be able to charge because there's no, these students are paying for this out of loans. There's no conceivable way that a student is making, that an average student is making forty thousand dollars a year while going to school full-time that may depend on whether the student is still a dependent of their parents if we're talking about undergrads in particular many of them would be right but i'm, I'm saying like we're not we're not under some delusion that this is a product that a student can like flip burgers right. 10 hours a week and afford to pay this rent that's right. in no way the case right. they're they're paying for the rent through the same way that they're paying for the rent if they live in the dorms or if they live in private housing off campus. It's just that there's no, in, more student housing available. In fact, we just did some quick calculations and assuming a $20 per hour rate, which is not an easy assumption to make for students in particular, um, for the largest unit, they'd have to work 53.75 hours a week for this unit um, for it to be 30%. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was wrong. It was 59. You have to work 60 hours a week. Yeah. So um, I am one of those people who will be paying back her student loans until the year after she dies um, and worked two jobs as a PA to a venture capitalist and as a waitress. And uh, I don't love the idea of giving the next generation that same burden as well as that same stress while they're in school. Um, and and I'll restate, I'll, I'll agree to what Councilman Petro said and say it in a different way. I, I don't think that that rent restriction, part of this, this uh, impact fee reimbursement deal is really buying us anything because it's not at all getting it to a point where 
it's right. a unit that someone can afford without having loans for the rest till, until the year after they die. Like that, right. that's still the case. So I'm going to look at this as though, okay, is $2.5 million reimbursement worth $2.5 million worth of scholarships over the next 10 years? Right, right. That, I mean, that's essential. Because I think back to the, the idea about the, uh, the the rent. Basically, that's student housing. Is this the same? Is this the same cost as student housing on on, on campus student housing? I mean, there's different I, costs. Maybe because I don't know. Because there's also uh, you have a, you have uh, food vouchers or yeah, yeah, okay. meal plans. Thank you, council yeah, members. Any other questions on this that we haven't yet brought up? Okay, uh, good discussion. Uh, are we good to move on, or do we need to? It does the applicant, uh, it's not a land use request. Do you want to address us? I'd love to. That okay. Right. I'll, I'll Do you, can ask that body oh. Oh, okay. So it's not allowed unless the whole body consents. Okay. I, th I think since you already, you know, might as well. Does the it. body agree to allowing the applicant to address us? Okay. Could you just take a couple minutes and, and keep it as brief as possible? to address two items that were brought up um, by council I'm sorry. Uh, so please introduce yourself for the record and speak super close to the microphone. Sure. My name is Annalisa Wilson, and I'm here representing Ivory University House L3C. Um, and the first thing I want to address is just the fact that it is an L3C because I know that is a unique entity that we don't run into a lot. And so um, just to address any concerns of it not being operated on a nonprofit basis, I can guarantee to this council that it will be more of a nonprofit than any nonprofit that has ever been before you today. And that's because we are contractually obligated in our lease with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that we cannot keep one dollar of profit. Every single dollar up and above our operating costs must go to a scholarship fund at the university. So we are very much operating in a nonprofit way. Um, the second issue is to clarify the scholarship. So no, not every student at Ivory University House will be on scholarship. It is a student, a regular student housing project. Um, and it is comparable in cost and in fact more affordable than many of the student housing options that are nearby. Um, but the reason why the Ivory family has committed to provide rental assistance for 25% of the students, that is separate from the scholarship fund. That is just something that the family wants to do because they feel it's important to have diversity, to have the best student experience on campus. And so that is why they're doing the rental assistance. It is separate from the Ivory University Scholarship Fund. Recipients from that fund are not required to live at Ivory University House. They'll have many different housing options if they do get a housing voucher or they may not even receive housing assistance. They may receive a tuition stipend or some other type of scholarship assistance. So those, those two items are, are separate. So those were the only two items I heard that I felt I could clarify, but I'm happy to answer additional Sorry, I questions. I think you brought up something new that I wasn't aware of or maybe just said the same thing in a different word. There's also a housing assistance fund that's a piece of this agreement. Sure. Well, it's not a separate fund. There's the Ivory University House Scholarship Fund that will be housed at the University of Utah and funded through the revenue that is created by the Student Housing Project. Okay. And then separate from that, the Ivory family has committed that 25% of the students at Ivory University House will be receiving some type of housing assistance, whether it's from the Ivory University House Scholarship Fund or some other type of housing assistance directly from Ivory University House so that we can have a diverse array of students living there who may not be able to afford the full tuition. In Salt Lake City residents. And is that 25%? That's just something that's going to happen regardless. That's correct. not that's a, a condition of our impact free reimbursement. That, that's Understood. correct. Okay. That's just how the Ivory family wants this project to, okay. to be Okay, But that's not, so, that's not pertinent to the impact fee reimbursement. Correct. Okay. That, is the, that would be the $2.5 million coming out of the larger scholarship fund from the university to Salt Lake City residents. Understood. Okay. Quick question, uh, Mr. Chair, and I think I don't necessarily want an answer f uh, right now on the spot. You know, it was brought up uh, as far as residency, and I think a couple of us here are, you know, inter were international students at some point or another, and we were not qualifying to residency, uh, you know, f for multiple reasons, uh, even, you know, so that's something that I would like uh, you guys to explore. Um, 
we happen to eventually qualify and you know we get naturalized and oh. get elected but uh, i also would like to explore that uh, some okay. some different cl more creative definition of what Salt Lake City residents means uh, so. thank you for that feedback that makes a lot of sense councilman Puy. like what 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 does it mean to qualify for that set aside 2.5 million dollars of salt lake city resident scholarships and do you have to be a naturalized citizen or can you be an immigrant I, that's a I, that's a perfect question thank you for bringing that up all right i think that's all we have thank on you, this Council. item um there's a this is a public benefits now so there will be a public hearing set for already happened oh we set the public hearing last time September 5th, okay I always read this thing wrong September 5th will be our public comment period on this item so let us know what you think um, okay so we are convened as the Salt Lake City Council but we are also now convened as the RDA board because we're going to enter in closed session for so mr. chair yes go ahead I, I would like to make I move to uh, that we enter into a closed session in our capacity as both the City Council and the redevelopment agency board the purpose of the closed session for both entities is to receive advice from legal counsel in addition the purpose of the RDA closed session might include discussion of this position of real property second okay I have a, a uh, motion from Councilmember Puyo, second from Councilmember Valdemoros. Do I have any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, I'll roll call Councilmember Dugan. Yes. Valdemoros? Yes. Petro? Yes. Wharton? Puy? Yes. Young? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes seven to zero. For the record, we will adjourn as RDA board after this, but we um, are only recessing from council work session. Okay. Thank you. And we will go to closed session. Today has been, we've bounced around a lot. So now we are, we have, we're now back in council work session. And we are on item seven of the work session, which is. Um, unallocated housing program income funds follow-up discussion. Uh, ben Ludke, Tammy Hunsaker, Tony Milner, and I think Blake may be online as well for this discussion. Ben, do you want to queue it up? Uh, this is a follow-up briefing from the council's discussions uh, on February 21st and during the annual budget. There is a handout at your seats as well as attached to the online packet summarizing the individual proposed projects and programs by their type, the funding source, and which city division or department would be the lead. The potential next steps are listed in the column on the right most side, and those are if the council supports that item. The funding amounts were estimated in the annual budget so the actual program income received could be somewhat different, not by a lot, a little bit, based on the amounts on the handout. This is because uh, we were estimating the amounts before the end of the fiscal year. So if one of the programs generated more income, if a loan was repaid earlier, we wouldn't have been able to predict that. So there could be an item in a future budget amendment to true up the estimated amounts before you to what the actuals are. And that would come to the council later this year. The administration is seeking the council's feedback on these proposed uses, uh, whether they're supported, and if there are any items where you would like to provide further policy guidance or ask for more information. With that, I'll turn it over to Tammy for a presentation. Tammy, can you turn on your microphone? I, it doesn't, I'm sorry. Oh, thank there. you. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, this is a table of the funds that Ben outlined. Um, it's important to note that they are split, in, split into two general categories, the HUD 
funding, which is CDBG and home program income, and then non-restricted funds. Um, if you could go to the next slide. This is a table of the administration's proposed funding recommendations. Many of these recommendations are based on uh, policy direction previously provided by the council. Timeliness requirements um, were an important consideration for the HUD funds um, in an effort to identify projects that are shovel ready and that are um, that will help us meet timeliness. We did also reach out to the Housing Authority of Salt Lake City for potential partnership opportunities due to the um, relationship between our two organizations. So um, these funding categories, the, the HUD restricted and the non-restricted, they have two separate paths forward. So Tony is going to outline the HUD program income first. That will be treated um, through its own process and then he will turn it back over to me and I will go through the non-restricted funds. Great, thank you. Can we go to the next slide? And then the one after that. Okay, uh, and again, huge thanks to Council for your guidance and direction as we bring forward these dormant funds. Um, we recently had a monitoring with our HUD representative, and they were very happy to hear that the Council is very, uh, this is front and center for you. You know the importance of getting these funds out in a timely manner, and then especially not having to give the funds back to HUD. Both HUD recognizes the benefit that these funds can have in our community. So, Moving forward and getting ourselves into alignment, both with city practice as well as HUD practice, is basically beginning of the, this fiscal year, program income generated from any HUD funded activities will be recaptured on an annual basis. We always are making sure that we have to be spending our program income first before any new funds from HUD. Uh, program income will be estimated and considered as part of the annual HUD application process, which is brought forward to you around if, if, uh, it's like April or May. Um, and then, of course, council has the final funding allocations for the different grant recipients. For example, we kind of brought forward a, a million dollars in CDBG as well as 800,000 in home. Again, that is just for fiscal year 24 anticipated for this year. So we're finally in alignment. So next steps that if the council does uh, indicate support for administrative proposed funding allocations, Housing Stability will finalize and transmit a substantial amendment to our city's five-year HUD consolidated plan, as well as this year's one-year annual action plan. We also work with council staff to initiate the 30-day minimum requirement, which is, re which is needed for public process and input, including a public noticing period and a public hearing. So after that public input, City Council considers and adopts resolutions for the con plan and annual action plan substantial amendments. We submit it to HUD for their review and then HUD has 30 days to then approve. Can you go to the, oh, then advance the slides. Next slide. And then next slide. So timeline, and again, last time we were briefing in June, you were very aware of just the time frame that we have, which is mainly, the biggest one is CDBG. Every year we have to meet a timeliness test. It's always very hard to meet that timeliness test. If we're gonna be bringing forward additional funds, they'll make that test even harder. Uh, so there will be strict expenditure timeline uh, requirements once the consolidated plan and the annual action plan are amended to recognize the funds. CDBG and home have different timelines, uh, CDBG requirements are more immediate. Uh, we're only allowed to have basically whatever our annual entitlement is for that year plus one and a half of that calc and that calculation is done every year on May 1st. If we are over that calculation, then we are subject to be out of alignment. Next slide. So the proposed allocations for CDBG, and again, this is all in the information that's in front of you. Three here, and these are from council uh, provided directions. One would be property acquisition around 5.7. This could be for the acquisition of a future property for the development of housing, 80% AMI. Uh, CAN can work with RDA and the Housing Authority, for example, to identify and purchase a property or multiple properties. Council could identify policy priorities such as high opportunity area properties, uh, community land trust acquisitions, or possibly missing middle housing. 
Another one that council provided direction on was west side improvements, 250,000. That would be sidewalk and related infrastructure improvements on the west side to promote safety, accessibility, and connectivity. Uh, part of that being, again, timeliness for, for all three of these categories would be possibly funding or being leveraged with an existing infrastructure program or a project, so then that way those funds can be spent in a timely manner. Uh, last one is the a facade program. This is something that council was interested in to get additional dollars into the city's very successful neighborhood business improvement program, which is also called the facade program for small businesses in a west side target area. Uh, the council did approve 925,000 in CDBG funds already for this year. And so these additional funds would provide more opportunities for about five more applicants to be served this year. Next slide. So then the proposed allocations for the home funds and quick correction, if you can see there in that box that where it says RDA NOFA, it says 5.7, that actually should be 6.476, $14. The rest of it, I apologize, it's wrong on this slide, but it's, current, it's correct throughout. Um, so this would be gap financing for the development of affordable housing. Uh, funding would be used to you know, go through the RDA's annual housing development loan program uh, and their, no, their NOFA, which is coming up pretty soon. And we've actually been in conversations with them about these funds. Uh, the RDA can move forward with issuing the NOFA and selecting the uh, projects while we're still doing the HUD substantial amendment process. So that shouldn't hold up. It shouldn't hold up their timeline at all. We're able to do both of them uh, at the same time. The other one is housing development, and this is one that in communication with the Housing Authority for Salt Lake City is a project on 1159 West, Tem uh, West Temple, it's just north of the ballpark area. This is a project that has been in the plans for a while. The RDA already gave about a million dollars about six years ago, and then just recently last year gave an additional 540. This year they're currently applying for LIHTC 9%. Uh, roughly, it's about 55 units. They're still getting the exact bedroom broken down of how many bedrooms. Um, all the units will be at least 60% or below, including some deeply affordable for homeless individuals. Uh, it's a very good project. Such funding uh, being directly uh, you know, directed towards them by council decision, if that is your decision, would definitely help a project like this. So funding would be leveraged with allocations already approved by the RDA, and but then of course, uh, importantly, it would be subject to the underwriting and lending standards outlined in RDA's HDLP policy. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, thanks, Tony. I will go over the non-restricted funding sources. If we could go to the next slide. Um, just a quick clarification before moving forward. I know there's a lot of working parts here and moving parts, and it's been moving quickly. The, it's my understanding that the RDA NOFA amount, which is the $6.476 million, that has been allocated through the budget. So the next step there would be to have that approved through the HUD um, substantial amendment. So the council has actually already made that funding allocation. And then the other funding allocation on the chart that has been made is my understanding it's the NOAA renter rehab program for 1.2 million. So those have already been made. Um, and HUD, uh, Tony went through the HUD process and, and the HUD um, program income is really the piece that's timely and we need to move quickly on. The non-restricted funds we have a little bit more time to uh, work out and get situated. So what the administration is proposing with the non-restricted funds is to um, capitalize a revolving loan fund that would be established through legislative action moving forward. Um, as a point of clarification, this loan fund would support programs targeted to tenants and homeowners where the RDA's tools typically support development activities. And there are about 575 outstanding home buyer and home rehab loans with a balance of about 25 million. So establishing a formal loan fund with um, previous program income as well as new repayments coming back to the city um, would allow us to continue to provide revenue for housing activities that benefit 
homeowners and tenants. So it would be a great way to formalize um, those activities. If we go to the next slide, this is just a brief overview of how that loan fund would function. Um, re uh, revolving cap capital would be budgeted annually by the council to the programs associated with the loan fund. These programs would be revolving in nature with principal and interest payments returning to the fund. However, at the council's discretion, you could use revenue from the fund annually to fund like one-time initiatives. If you go to the next slide. These are the four programs that we are proposing be attached to the loan fund. We're proposing that the home buyer program, which provides below market rate mortgages to moderate and low income households um, to further home ownership opportunities. We're proposing a million dollars be allocated to that program. We're proposing just over 1.14 million be allocated to the community land trust. I think you know the land trust model the city maintains ownership of the land, the homeowner buys the housing improvements, and then we lease the land at a below market value to further affordability. The home repair program, we're proposing 500,000 be allocated to that for emergency home repair. And then the NOAA renter rehab program has already been allocated 1.2 million through the budget, but we're proposing that that program be part of this revolving loan fund. Tim? Do we have to stop? Can, no. Well, I don't think so. Okay. Can I suggest that we change the name to NOAA Rental Rehab Program? Because we're not rehabbing <laughs> the tenants. Uh, yes. We're rehabbing the units, right? Yes, that's good. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good catch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then the, if we go to the next slide, we have three more allocations to discuss. Um, these would be with the non-restricted funds. These are not proposed to be part of the revolving loan fund. These would be direct allocations. So we're proposing 180,000 be allocated to rental assistance, and this would be leveraged with 180,000 that the council already approved through the FY24 budget for a new pilot tenant relocation program that's proposed through Thriving in Place. We're also proposing that based on council's direction, 60,000 be provided to public services activities. I don't know if you remember back when you were deliberating on CDBG applications, you requested that some of this funding make some of the applications whole up to the applied to amount. Um, there's four nonprofits that this would go to, to a, for a total of 60,000. And then um, we've talked about this in previous briefings, but um, over the last, I, I think it's uh, at least the last decade, there was um, a line of credit that the city would provide some um, mortgage buy down. Um, it's, it's kind of complicated, but the city hasn't been using the line of credit in a while, and so we are proposing that $3 million of these non-restricted funds just go to pay off the line of credit. The line of credits, there were, there were two line of credits. They're not active any longer, so we could just get rid of that debt and stop that practice moving forward. So we're proposing $3 million be used for that. So I know we're short on time, but the questions for city council really are, are you supportive of our funding, our recommended funding allocations? If so, we will quickly turn around uh, an amendment to the HUD consolidated plan and annual action plan so we can get that moving and help meet our timeliness requirements. And then the other big policy question for the council is, is the council um, supportive of the idea of a tenant and homeowner revolving loan fund that these programs can be attached to. Um, if so, we will bring forward draft policies to establish that loan fund and to formalize the programs attached to it um, for the council's consideration. Next slide, please. Member Young and then Wharton. So thank you. I just have a quick question about order of operations. So 
with the council's support, you will move forward to amend the existing consolidated application. Do we have to wait for that application to be approved before we can begin action on these time-sensitive restricted funding? I'm just trying to understand whether that has to happen and what our expectation is yes. that agency will move. For the restricted funding, yes. Okay. And generally speaking, do you have an expectation on timeline related to how quickly they respond to those amendments? Yes, we basically have the substantial amendment transmittal ready to send to council um, so we can get that going. We do, again, we work with council staff to set up a 30-day public notice period, okay. including the public hearing that you guys will host. And then basically we give over to HUD. HUD takes about 30 days to okay. approve it. Sometimes they'll do it a lot sooner than that. There is a little bit of flexibility. Uh, Tony and the housing team have been working with RDA staff um, because the RDA NOFA money has been allocated by council. So the RDA can actually go ahead and issue that notice of funding availability, actually select applications. We just can't enter into a formal commitment of funding with a developer. So we're still moving forward on some of these processes. That makes Great. sense. Thank you. Important. Um, so I didn't We've got eight minutes left before we okay. have to start truth and taxation. I it's it's not really a I just I don't I didn't understand the tenant and homeowner loan fund and how it would work and the ins and outs of it. Was I supposed to gather all that from the slide? We, it was a high level overview. Okay. If you're supportive of the loan Sounds fund great. concept for yes. tenants and homeowners, we would bring back additional detail. Yes, I love the self funding part. Um, so it sounds magic. So that's the part that I don't understand, but I'm generally in favor of it. And but I want to uh, just more. A, a, yeah, a piece of, of clarification. Like it's it's the program income that's been generating would actually go into a formalized loan fund. So it would be principal and interest coming back to the city right. from outstanding loans. <sighs> we have about twenty five million in outstanding loans that we're getting we're collecting revenue from. Okay, maybe maybe I didn't understand because I didn't know that, but okay. This is also one of several programs and it's listed in the next steps column. Right. That programs that do not have council adopted guidance and policies. So as part of the, the next steps, getting into those nitty gritty details would come to the council. The administration would draft policies for you to consider and there'd be future briefings for you to review, modify, and ultimately adopt. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm grasping all the concepts. The ones I do, I, I like, so I think, yeah, go for it. Um, okay, I'll say I, I, I like all these things, Councilmember Petro, and we really do is, need to is this all so Is this all of the funds, or is this just like the most time bound that we're dealing with? It is all of the funds. So the CDBG and the home column, those two columns on the left, are the most timely. The non-restricted, there's more flexibility. These are all of, most all of the funds. It's the funds um, through April 30th. There's probably a little bit of program income that was generated between April 30th and the end of the fiscal year that we will sweep up through a future budget amendment. It, it would be a true up. Uh, it's almost like the annual true up for the RDA property tax increment. We estimate it's a little different, and then it comes to the council to recognize the difference. Perfect. All right. Any more comments? Thank you so much for this work and exciting that we can use all this money. Great. <clears throat> all right. We have five minutes to switch. Do you have to switch recordings and stuff? Oh. I thought we had to do that. I was cut. I was cutting people off unnecessarily. Um, it's the same link, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's the same link, Mr. Chair. Oh, we just is that Council Member Pui? Just, no, it is. Yep, just stay in this meeting, I guess. Yeah, if you, okay. we just need literally ten seconds to stop the existing recording and then to start a new one. All right. Well, I, uh, we are a we the board appointee is not here. Still right. Yeah. Okay, we're adjourned from work session and we'll see you in four minutes for Truth and Taxation.